Tom Schneider Det er ikke super Det er jo ikke Det er jo ikke Det er jo ikke Det er What's that? Downstairs, it was like a hundred candle no, fingers. Maybe, you know, maybe you're used to you like that. <laughs> that queen, that queen is a tropical one. Are we done? Phones off. Okay. Are we done with Should we all touch the chair? Sorry, I'm what was it, What was your first, uh, like, punk record, Dave? Oh, we found that? Both of them? I'm, I'm just, 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 you just, just trying to get in there. Oh, okay, sorry. Go, go ahead. <laughs> it's a punk record? Yeah. yeah. Probably the first class I And then, like, what was when did you start getting interested in like local bands? Probably 1983 when I first started going to see live music. What was I'm looking at you. I'm looking at the camera. You can look at me. Or whatever, whatever yeah. makes you, whatever makes you feel better. What was this? What was like some of the first local bands that you went to check out? Uh, first local band I ever saw was the Nihilistics at my father's place on Long Island. Nice. Good show. Who did they play with? <laughs> I, not only would I not remember the names of the bands, but I was so new to that music that I couldn't tell you who was really good or bad. What, like, what was it about the music you, you responded to? Just the aggression. And then that's that you got interested in like local scene after that, like the stuff that was going on with you. Where were you living? I grew up on Long Island. I was paying attention at that point to what was going on on Long Island, a little bit of what was going on in New York City. Uh, then in the fall of 83, I went to college in Albany, where there was a, a bit of a local scene, but not much. Started going to shows then, and uh, the subsequent summer of 84, I started putting on shows in Albany, and that's sort of when I really became full-time in all the music stuff. And what, when did you, uh, uh, like, something you could participate in beyond, like, going to shows, when did that occur for you? Probably in 84, when I started putting on shows. And how did you, like, the, did you just think, like, a kind of show, and just, like, kind of take you through the steps? I had uh, gone earlier in 84 to go see uh, Seven Seconds, who I had been writing to Kevin for a long time. Uh, they played a show in Syracuse that was in a bowling alley put on by a guy from a band up there called the Catatonics, uh, Bell V.K. <laughs> Bell V.K., who's now a Brooklyn right? Uh, and at some point, I've been up playing drums for seven seconds. Uh, and went to go see him, met Belvy, and Belvy said, the Catatonics want to play in Albany, put on a show. And he really walked me through finding a hall, finding a sound system. And from there, it was off to the races. Two or three weeks later, we did another show, and then kept shows going on there for years. Was this something that you had, like, before in life, like, uh, has you like, you know, done anything from the ground up like this, or was this was just the music that kind of made you find this? No, it was the it was the music, and it was, you know, the attitude from the music of uh, nobody's going to do it for you; you got to do it yourself. Cool. Okay. So, and then when you started coming down to shows at, at CBGBs and stuff, or when did that start checking it out down there? Well, I, I saw shows at CBGBs when I was living on Long Island, but really. When I was in Albany, it started coming down much more frequently with stuff that was going on at CVs, with the Rock Hotel stuff. And then uh, I ended up moving down to New York in 87 when I started going to law school in the city. And what was it like compared to where you had come from? Was it maybe uh, more people or maybe it was more... more uh, oh, it, was a, it was a very... You know, Long Island was a different scene than New York City. New York City was different than everywhere. Uh, the scene that we had worked to develop in Albany was very different than anywhere else because it was uh, much more suburban kids, much less urban. People didn't have the hard of lives that a lot of people in the New York scene did. Uh, so it was a very different feel, not better, not worse, but just something that was very different. The bands from New York who came up there and played loved playing up there because we didn't have fights, we didn't have all the drama and problems that surrounded a lot of the other scenes. Was that like a pretty apparent as soon as you came down here? That it was that it was a little more Well I mean I knew down I, I knew New York City from growing up on Long Island. But I mean as far as it, yeah. I I know I know that just from going like from one situation where you're booking shows and stuff to then the, the moving down here and being there probably I still would assume every week for a while and Yeah, it, it, it was clearly a very different scene. And different characters and you know as as life split said uh, people from all walks of life. 
and New York City, I mean, that, that song exemplifies what New York City hardcore was, and it wasn't the same everywhere else. A lot of places were, were a lot more of the same type of people. And you say it was diverse, like, obviously diverse ethnically, diverse economically, like, maybe, uh, like, there was that, like, something that, that you, uh... Diverse, I mean, New York City's hardcore scene was just a microcosm of what New York City was. So I, I think there were more, a greater variety of people from, from different countries, from different ethnic backgrounds, different religions, different socioeconomic status. New York City runs the gamut of all those things, so it would be no surprise to find all of those things present in the hardcore scene. And I, I don't think there's anywhere else in the country that, that boasts as wide a variety of various types of people. As far as information is finding out, like where the shows were, like there was other things going on with the CBGBs. There was there was the pyramid. There was stuff going on to like right track in, you know. Uh, like, how did this information get around back back then? Back then, it was a lot of people standing out show outside shows, handing out flyers. I think that was the big way you learned what was happening next. You know, it was well before the days of the internet, and the fanzines carried some show listings, but. But not enough. It was really word of mouth, and uh, sometimes word of mouth helped by uh, hacked sprint telephone calls. <laughs> and aside from uh, flyers, like, aside, sorry, aside from CBGBs and from from being hanging at shows, like what was other places that people would congregate and 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 so like you know was Rat Cage still going when you came down here or like what was, was there? Like, I I never hung out at Rat Cage, but. Uh, when I was hanging around, one of the big places was Sun Records. And where was that? East 6th Street. I want to say 210 East 6th Street. That's not the bar, right? 210 East 6th Street. 216? No, 210. What was Reconstruction? 216. Same block. Yeah. Two yeah. yeah. Uh, so Sun Records was a, a place that people certainly found out about what was going on. And that was, uh, did you notice? Uh, the more you hung out at 87 on the gymnasium, there was more do-it-yourself uh, things happening, such as record labels popping up and more fan scenes and more people like doing things to... to well, I think as the scene grew bigger, there were more people and therefore more people were doing things. What were some of the scenes that you, that you uh, back then, that you remember that stand out for you that, that you definitely were, you know, excited when they came out and waiting for them? And I was never a big scene guy. Okay. So I'm not gonna, well, no. I'm not gonna front on that. <laughs> Record labels? Was there was there one that, that maybe you uh, uh, you know when you finally started to, to, to get into that for record zone? Was there some was there like a model that you had? I mean, obviously everybody paid attention. I shouldn't say everybody. A lot of people paid attention to what Discord was doing because they were the people who did it right and consistently, especially at that point, consistently put out great records for a good low price. And you knew if it was on that label, you know the by those guys agreeing to put out something, uh, at least at that point, it was definitely a, a stamp of quality. And that's sort of what uh, was great about indie labels, that you were relying on on one or two people's thoughts about what was good stuff for them to be able to put out. And that's not something that you got when you moved to, you know, the more corporate type labels like the In Effect or Relativity. Uh, when those guys started coming in, it was definitely a, a different feel because you know, while there may have been A and R guys, those guys weren't rolling the dice with their own money, taking risks. And I just think anybody drawing a paycheck uh, doesn't necessarily happen. Not necessarily doesn't have their ass on the line the same way someone who's playing with their own money does and putting out records. Uh, just down back for a quick second, like demos. Was was that something you were buying a lot of demos and, and uh, yeah, that... I mean. You know, Bands were selling demos outside shows. Some records sold a lot of demos. You wanted to hear what was going on. I was in a, a lucky position at that point to be putting on shows because bands would send me their demo tapes to get a bill. So I often heard stuff that was a practice tape and not, you know, it's hard to think of a demo being released, but they certainly were and they were sold and people put covers on it, whether they were recorded at home with two tape decks or whether they were manufactured somewhere. People were selling demo tapes for two to five bucks a pop, I guess. What, what are some classic demos you remember from that Sun Records era? Uh, just to stick, stick out in your mind. 
the Sick of It All demo was one with, with the uh, Calvin Hobbs on the front. Everybody wanted the Breakdown demo, the Chromax demo. Those were, were the classic ones, I think. Uh, was it, were you a tape trader at all? You traded no, tape? I never, the only time I got crazy about tapes was at some point I had beef eaters staying at my house and Tomas had a brand new band that hadn't played out yet from DC called Dag Nasty and he had their demo tape with him uh, with, with Sean Brown singing because he was the guy who was in the band at the time and I was so psyched on that that they drove me to service merchandise to get a dual well cassette deck so that I could make a copy of the tape because <laughs> it was that good and it still is and however many 20 some odd years later they finally released the song the same style. Do you remember any tape compilations from that time? I wasn't big into the tape compilation. I mean, obviously, the, the New Breed compilation was the tape compilation for New York. There were a bunch of things from the Midwest that I listened to, but nothing that nothing sticks out. Nothing stands out. I wasn't big on the tape thing. My friend Freddie Alva, <laughs> and probably still is. <laughs> were you aware of what was going on in other cities uh, via via meeting bands, because you're booking bands, or just the communication between different different towns, or different cities? I mean, back then. It was, I, I had a P.O. box and people wrote to each other with pen and paper. And, you know, and we figured out creative ways to save money. You used to always put glue on your stamps so that your stamps didn't get stamped by the post office. And that you'd write to people who had record labels, you'd write to people from bands. And, you know, that's, that was a lot of the way that you communicated and you know, maximum rock and roll as much as particularly people in New York, hated Tim Yohan, and most frequently for good reason. Uh, but that zine was great because you could keep up with what was going on through their scene updates and in other towns. And you always had, they had phone numbers or addresses, so you could write to people. And that's part of how uh, we used to book shows. You'd find a band that uh, was coming out your way, and you, you might try to find a promoter in Rochester or Buffalo that could work with you on a few days worth of shows so you could tell the band, hey, give me the Friday night show and I'll get your shows here Wednesday and Thursday. And that way you got to know the other promoters up in those areas. When you, did you deal a lot with bands coming here and saying, like, man, you know, they had a perception of what New York was like or did they have any kind of preconceived notions maybe? Or uh, was, it, was it maybe people would come to, sh to play here and maybe... Uh, didn't, you know, they, they didn't, uh, it was different from whatever. I mean, cra crazy things always went on in New York City that didn't go on anywhere else. And uh, I remember the first time Seven Seconds was supposed to play a famous agnostic front flyer. There was a whole to do with, uh, at the time, the JDL, because Bruce wrote something on a wall, and supposedly the JDL was going to come to the show, and there was a whole problem and seven seconds ended up never coming to New York City for that show. And no one really ever understood exactly why, but they had certainly heard those rumors that there was going to be problems at that show. And instead, Agnostic Front took a deer head off in the dumpster outside the Stevens before the show. Um, and that was the only beheading that day. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want to... General questions regarding that, I guess, do you remember any recollections from when the tape came out, the new tape came out, like in 88? I just remember people thinking how incredibly great Absolution was. I think that was mm -hmm. one of the bands, and, and Breakdown as well, and Line Spot, that, that really stuck out from that tape. But it was just, like, people were impressed that two guys from Queens mm -hmm. managed to get all these great bands to, to work together to put something out. Did you know Chaka or me at that time? I think I knew who you guys were, I'm sure. Sure, just from, you know, seeing you guys around at Sun and right. around shows and whatnot. Uh, a lot of, well, three or four of the bands on the tape, you put out records by them as well. How did the, uh, like, record label start up? Um, I was back in Albany for the summer of 
88, clerking for a judge. It's between my first and second year of law school. And uh, I was living with Steve Reddy at the time, who was already taking over, putting on the shows I had been putting on. And uh, we decided it was time to start a record label because nothing, there were some great bands we liked from Albany that nothing was happening for. And we wanted to try to, to start making an impression and putting out records of bands we really liked. So the first thing we did was, was a compilation that had a bunch of Albany bands to try to let people know, hey, we've, you know, not only are, is Albany a cool place to play, but we've got good local bands. And that's, that's what started it. And then uh, you did all the a &R for the label. <laughs> and uh, we managed Scotty. to... Scotty. We, we managed to... And, and uh, I'm sure we paid you all for it. Uh, <laughs> and just started out putting out records by bands, bands we liked. Right. What do you think the relevance of the comp is kind of 23 years after the fact? Uh, new kids are still getting into it, covering songs by it, on it, by bands on it. W which comp are you talking about? New uh, thing? New yeah. yeah. It, it's the first marketing point for a bunch of bands and a bunch of people who went on to other bands. So people pay attention to it because it's a great, uh, a great little marker in time, you know. And I, I think it's it's cool that 20, 20 some odd years later, you put it online for people who never heard it before to have a chance to discover what a, a good chunk of New York hardcore was in, in '88. How do you feel about I guess kind of transitional period '88, '89 when? I guess stuff in New York were kind of went off in different directions. Oh, and people used to dance with weapons? Is that what you're referring yeah, to? Kind of that. I kind of hinted to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I personally never took a, a lot of people I, that we knew. <laughs> I never took a weapon on the dance floor. Um, it got ridiculously crazy and for for no good reason. And it's uh, embarrassing that that time period happened and that not enough people did anything about it. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put myself in a bunch of people that didn't do anything about it instead of trying to figure out a solution. I studied my books and didn't go to as many shows in 89 as I had in 88 or 90 as I had in 89. You think it sense from, I mean, uh, when, when you went to it, was it 100% was it about the music? Was there like a, there was obviously a social aspect, but was there like a, um, any kind of, uh, bigger issues that you felt like the music could could uh, you know address or accomplish. Right? Yeah, I mean when when I was doing stuff, it was very much with the the positive force mentality of you know benefit shows for good causes and handing out you know I used to hand out animal rights literature and help turn out a bunch of people to, to vegetarianism back then, and it, there was definitely a, a greater social awareness uh, earlier on than there was in the late eighties. I couldn't tell you why it changed, but I know it did. And you think the music, the music definitely, like, you, you obviously you hear the tape and you remember you, know, you were there, but do you think at, taking out of that kind of that cultural context of the time, do you think that it, why do you think it still translates to some of the people? I can uh, reword the question. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't know that I'm capable of answering the question. <laughs> Okay. If I, if I did, I'd still own a record label and sell <laughs> a lot of records. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah great. Thank cool. you, Dave. <laughs> Hope I was.